Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast, where we bridge the gap to Reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. And today we're on a season six introduction to Reformed theology episode. Today we'll be talking about the communion of the saints and the church with Dr. Craig Troxell. And yes, he is affiliated with Westminster Seminary, California. If you guys haven't already guessed, uh, all our guests this season uh, are affiliated, they're either uh, faculty and or alumni from there. So we'll learn a little bit more about Dr. Troxel. He has been on our show before. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting him as well. And uh, so you guys will learn more about him when Peter introduces him a little further more. So if you go to our show notes, if you are not already doing this right now, you can find out more uh, ways to connect with us, including YouTube. You can watch these conversations via video on YouTube if that's a better platform for you. Or, of course, the other option would be a podcast catcher app. And then just uh, how to connect with us on social media. I guess I can't call Twitter Twitter anymore. I guess it's just X now, which is odd and to say, but Twitter <laughs> slash X and Instagram. And then uh, just if you guys need help finding a church to call home or reformed confessional church, there's under the Napark umbrella, there's uh, multiple reformed and Pre Presbyterian denominations, including the OPC, which is the one I go to. Uh, there's the URC and PCA and among many others. Uh, just find that local church finder and, and find the closest ones to visit near your area. And then uh, there's other information, including our website, our email, our confessional podcast network. Yes, we are part of a podcast network. We started with other like-minded reformed confessional podcasts out there. And so if you go to that website, uh, it will take you to these other really good podcasts out there. So um, they're friends of ours and we trust them enough to promote them. So uh, yeah, we'll jump into this conversation and let Peter further introduce our good friend, Dr. A. Craig Troxell. Yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce my former professor, it is always weird to say that, from Westminster Seminary, California, Dr. A. Craig Troxell, who's the relatively newly minted Robert G. Den Dolk Professor mm -hmm. of Practical Theology at Westminster, previously served as pastor of Bethel Presbyterian Church, which is an OPC in Wheaton, Illinois, from 2007 till he's appointed at Westminster, and then a pastor at Calvary Presbyterian Church in Glenside, Pennsylvania, from 95 to 07. It's a pleasure having you on our show, Dr. Troxell. Good to be with you guys again. Yeah, this will be, I'm trying to remember, what was the last time we had him on for Faith and Worse or something like that? I, this is off the, I should have looked this stuff up before, but <laughs> I think off the top of my mind, that's what it was. <laughs> had him on a couple times. <laughs> you can tell how professional I am at this. It's I don't do my research before. I do my research, but not this. And you're one of the few guests that I've actually met in person. You've guest preached at my church a couple times. And that was a pleasure meeting you. That's right. But you didn't ask him for a picture. I think I did. Did I not? He's so tall. Maybe I couldn't I get a picture. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be famous to get a picture. That's right. Well, he did ask for a picture from Dr. Van Druden. You can ask him how that went. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a stoic answer. It was, I don't know why you'd want a picture with me, but okay. <laughs> it was a, it was such a Van Druden response. It was, it's just memorable. Yeah. So uh, first, first icebreaker question, um, before we even get to anything else, you were a uh, football player in college. What, what position did you play? And uh, maybe not even your stats, but like, were you a good football player or was this, so tell us, tell us about your football journey. All football players get better and better the further they move <laughs> from right. the play. <laughs> yeah. so, so you must I, have been like legendary right now. I really should be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I was probably the skinniest tight end in the history of high school football. <laughs> but uh, when I got to college, I, I went out and um, made the team, then made the travel team, and eventually got the starting position as a wide receiver. I, I wasn't fast, didn't okay. break speed, but I was quick. Okay. I actually had one of the fastest shuttle shuttle times. Really? On the team. Yeah, okay. God gave me fast twitch muscle Do grouping. you remember your That's shuttle time? <laughs> What's that? Do you remember your shuttle time? No, no. I, I would if have you just said something like outrageous, and I would have believed you. No, I I have no idea. I have no idea. But it was fun. I really enjoyed it, and and I really, I truly missed it when I got out of college. I really did. 
Did you play all four years in college or? No, no, it's, it's weird. I went for spring football my junior year and I played only my senior year. I mean, I, I really, huh. I finally got some muscle, started gaining, you know, <laughs> lifting and yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was, I was playing, uh, this is, I can't believe we were talking about this, but <laughs> played in the, the championship game for the flag football. And there was, and this, we played this team. They're all ex football players. And one guy came up to me and says, why are you not playing on the team? And, uh, huh. Interesting. And so I tried out and I made the team. So, huh. but you played high school football. High school football played and played baseball. Uh, baseball is probably my best sport. And then basketball. We we had a really good team in basketball. But mm. anyway, there you go. It's well, fun. now everybody knows that Dr. Troxel was a was an esteemed, I mean, basically legendary football player back in college and in high school. <laughs> but <clears throat> let our audience know beyond your uh, your your um, ministry and your academic profile a little bit more about Dr. Troxel. Oh, uh, boy, there's not much to share. I I was raised in Nebraska. Uh I'm exceedingly proud of that um cuz people are just so normal there and, and uh, <laughs> That's right. And the football team's fantastic. Yeah, but yeah, not now, but uh <laughs> we need to go lay hands on them. Um <laughs> No, it's, I, I really love being from there. Uh, it's a state, it's kind of, it has, it's produced a lot of broadcasters and news. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Because the voice and the, the inflection is considered, be, it has the, um, there's no like real accent, but out where I, I went to high school, it definitely was an accent, these country kids. But um, yeah, no, just a simple guy. Uh, I've um, lived in a lot. I've been in all 50 states, by the way. Oh, wow. Lived in Germany when I was in uh, junior high, and that made a big impact upon me. Had a very, very slow uh, pilgrimage into the doctrines of grace that we're going to be talking about, mm -hmm. uh, but really raised by a wonderful family. Um, I love my siblings. We, we're a really tight family. I just feel like that's such a privilege. Yeah. And married to a very amazing person who was the one that God used in the end to bring me to, to the Reformed faith. That's right. I remember your stories about her. Yeah. I met her at Gordon Conwell and, and noticed her in orientation chapel sitting to my left. Mm -hmm. And uh, she admitted later, she noticed me too. Cause that's the only guy wearing cowboy boots, <laughs> jeans and a jean jacket. I bet it. Yeah. In the Northeast that, that sticks out. It really does. It was, that was my look. <clears throat> I like it. Cool. So like Nick talked about all guests from season six, as you are, um, are either Westminster faculty and or alumni, and you're a Westminster faculty, not an alumni. So the first one that we've had who's not an alumni, but a faculty member. Right. So you're a professor at Westminster. So we're going to ask you to start off three related questions. Um, and so these are, if you want to answer these uh, just in sequential order. Mm -hmm. First, what what drew you to teach at Westminster, especially having been a pastor for 25 or so years before that? Uh, what's the education like at Westminster, and particularly so in the PT department? And why should a prospective student look at Westminster for their ministerial or biblical education? Well, what drew me initially to Westminster were um, persistent friends. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> they wouldn't let me rest until I applied. Um, but I knew about the school because I was out here in 2002 for the Dendalk lectures, actually. And that's how I got acquainted with the campus and met faculty who are still here. Um, so I've, you know, watched it from a distance for some time. But I've worked with uh, Dr. Estelle, hmm. uh, Dr. Van Drew and I have been on the same com denominational committee for the last 17 years together. Uh, we came on to uh, John Fesco who used to be was a good friend. I officiated his wedding. He married one of my church members. I actually oh. introduced them together. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, so that's a long story. <laughs> okay. so I have these little connections, but what drew me in, in many ways was I believed in this school because it was confessional. It was unapologetically saying we hold to this confessional tradition uh, that the reformers fought for, and, and we want to line up with them. And I, I love that. I think that, and, and Machen, that was his vision yeah. in terms of the OPC. Yep. And so I've always appreciated that. I was raised in a non-creedal church. I was raised in the Church of God. They did not believe in the creed. They would hold the Bible and say, we, we have no creed but the Bible. And that's not really true. <laughs> that's a creed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a great idea. But um, yeah. But no, I was drawn for those reasons, um, I would say. Very attracted to the school for that. And, and, I, and I felt like I could trust the faculty. 
I had, I'd worked with two sessions, one in Philadelphia and one in, in Wheaton. But I trusted my brothers. I, I enjoyed the privilege of working with men that I absolutely trusted. Hmm. And I felt like that was, um, those were most of my questions to these guys when I came and interviewed. Hmm. I, knew cool. where they were, I knew where they were theologically. and Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be the uh, the reason what drew me. Okay. What's education like? I would say a lot of people would say it's rigorous. Um but that's just one angle. I mean, I've not met, I've met a couple people. Well, I should, I'll try it this way. I've had two friends who went to med school and they said seminary was harder. Mm -hmm. it, it Not taxing, it's during the same hours and things like that. Sure. Or but, but maybe it is <laughs> the same. A lot of, it just, it's very difficult. But I would say at Westminster, what makes it unique is the face-to-face, Mm -hmm. uh, the student faculty ratio. I mean, Peter, you know this. My door is always open. Oh yeah, yep. Uh, and so you can drop in, and you know the first question is always, is, "Do you have a few minutes, or is this a good time?" And and I like that. I didn't have that kind of accessibility to some of my professors. And when you signed, like David Wells had a chart on his door at Gordon Conwell, and they were fifteen minute increments, hmm. and only the most brazen student would dare to sign up for two back to back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's got something about your self, you know, confidence. But anyway, um, so I would say that's a big part of it. And mm -hmm. and what I like about about this is you get to know students. I'm writing recommendation letters for our graduates with a clear conscience. Yep. And um, but I would say that's a that's a big big plus. Why you would come to school like this is that you're going to get to know your professors. Oh yeah. Yep. And it's I would say it's well rounded. I mean, you're going to get really. Uh, first class church history. You're going to get strong exegesis, good theology, and um, and of course the the preeminent department, the practical theology department. <laughs> That's right. All it's, the other departments serve yeah. the PT department. Exactly right. I, I've never heard it put so well. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <clears throat> but no, but and we get along. I mean, Michael Horton yeah. said in the panel last year. He was asked about the faculty. He said, "You know what? We really like hanging out together. We we genuinely like each other." Mm -hmm. And it, we used to have a saying on football. And a guy told me this since I was a receiver. He said, "If you're a friend with the quarterback off the field, you're his friend on the field." Mm. And and because we had struck up a, a friendship, uh, Tim Metzke, who is our our quarterback, and I think the same is is true here. That if we're friends off the field, if outside the classroom, we can enjoy each other. Yeah. Um. Then we do well side because I I work with uh, Jason Berry, we team teach this mm -hmm. coming semester three classes together. Yeah. Yep. And yep. One, of the, one of them we will not eventually, but students really enjoy that. You mm -hmm. know, we have some give and take and fooling around OPC versus PCA, <laughs> you know, <laughs> things like that. But but they really see how much we love each other and we work well together. Yeah. And I think that's a great thing: the cohesiveness and the unity of our faculty. Totally. Yeah, that's got to help a lot. Being friends with people that you work with. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's, well, it's tremendous, and students can see it. You can't hide it. But you know, I've had friends that work on faculties where they can't get along, where they don't trust the administration, or yep. Yep. they have somebody down the hall who's teaching exactly opposite of what they want, and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And we we talk. We have really wonderful discussions in our faculty meetings about things. Just you know, just to learn where we're coming from. Um, so especially with new faculty coming, I think it's important. Yep. Yeah. Two new guys this year. Yep. Very exciting. And I've taken both of them to TJ's to try the Autobata. Which is where you have to, if you're an Escondido. TJ's, for those who are listening, TJ's is a hallowed establishment. It's not Trader Vincent. Joe's? <laughs> no, TJ's Tacos. <laughs> I know. Okay. You know, there is a Trader Joe's, but it's two, it's four miles away from campus, which in right. Escondido driving is about 30 minutes. But you go to TJ's Tacos. We'll, yeah. we'll show you a good time. Yeah, cool. Come and I'll take you myself. Okay, good. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. There you go. In this way. And I'm I'm sure a lot of people probably assume maybe uh, that all Christian seminary schools, all the all the faculty would just automatically get along because they're Christian. But I guess yeah. you can't take that for granted. That no, you know that's probably not the case. But at Westminster Seminary, of California, it seems like all you guys really have a good uh cohesiveness and get along well like you're saying and it and what helps is is being confessionally committed we know where the lines are the boundaries are but there's tremendous freedom 
-hmm. of how we express things within that. But my wife and I met at Gordon Conwell, and that school mm -hmm. represented the the bandwidth of evangelicalism, which yeah, was a cafeteria popular. approach. Yeah. Yeah, because you had a lot of Presbyterians, PCUSA, mainline students, but the second largest group were Assemblies of God. Huh. And so it was pretty wide. Yeah. On, on everything. Yeah, yeah. And one, one thing, I, <clears throat> before you answer the last question, one thing I actually want to kind of push on a little bit is just because of the trope with Westminster being so academic is they tend to like kind of eschew preaching and counseling, all that stuff. If you can talk to those who are struggling with like, I, <clears throat> I want to go to a more practical seminary that, that really emphasizes more of these classes. Why would I go to Westminster that, that they just produce academics and, and those people who are really smart in the Bible, but don't really know how to preach it or don't know how to counsel. Um, so being in the PT department, the head of the PT department, what would you, how would you talk to somebody um, who, who thinks that? Yeah, I I can understand why somebody would think that. That's definitely not our tradition. That's that's not uh, John Calvin, for instance. Yeah. Um, but we just now uh, have uh, introduced a second requirement of counseling into the oh. to the main curriculum. Okay. And so, uh, marriage and family will now be uh, a, a second required counseling course, and the whole faculty agreed with that. Dang. Okay. Then the other thing too is we've revamped the preaching curriculum that now starting this semester all five preaching classes are genre based oh interesting we're really really excited about that so this this semester i'm going to be teaching preaching wisdom text that's never been a course taught yeah and um so along with narrative and doctrinal ethical we'll introduce yeah. preaching poetic text and then yeah. preaching prophetic or preaching prophetic text and and the part that I did was to make it more practical in terms of how do you actually preach these genres of the Bible. So mm. I took a poll of the whole faculty, and we landed on these five genres as best representative of. of I wish I had a sixth class preaching class I could throw in there. <laughs> yeah, because uh, we could do this all day. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I would say, and I would say another thing too: the pastoral ministry seminar has has been really revamped. Uh, yeah. Peter, that you was got my that, favorite that, class that, of Westminster. That, it was probably that was still morphing, but now it's it's very much the readings are very practical huh. and it's discussion oriented. Uh, ministry of the word, we completely have changed that class and mm -hmm. trying to take the best of what we've had. But now that's a fully integrated class. At the very last three classes in that, we we teach the students hands on how to get from the text to preparing a sermon. So it gets mm -hmm. you ready for you know your next pre your your first preaching class. So literally, how to outline? How do we preach Christ from the different genres? And we're doing it's all hands-on, demonstrating that, and th that has been a real uh, treasure, I think, in what we've introduced in that class. So, no, I would say we got lots of practical stuff. I teach an elective. I don't think I did this when you were here yet on reformed spirituality. Yeah, so I think that came right as I was leaving. So we had like thirty auditors for that class um last year and we want to introduce more hmm. leading in worship that's a that's a yeah that is an elective i taught last year and it's just about how do you lead in worship and just yeah. invocational prayer what does that look like how do you yeah. do that yep hmm. anyway so no that's really helpful yeah that thing that's uh the reason why i asked that not part of the questions i originally sent over but it is the kind of the common trope <clears throat> that Westminster's too academic, not pastorally oriented, which, you know, that may have been true in a former age um, or maybe kind of like more on one side than the other. But it is uh, it's it, people maybe don't know, don't know it or are working on assumptions or whatever it is. But it's helpful to hear from the source that this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm very excited about it. And uh, this is season six, Introduction to Reformed Theology. So our goal with this season is <clears throat> introducing Reformed Theology for the first time to a lot of people uh, that aren't Christian or new Christians, maybe even outside the Reformed tradition, um, or just Reformed Christians that want a refresher on this stuff. Can't hurt, definitely. So a lot of this stuff, these questions are going to be based on our confessions and catechisms that are you know part of our reformed tradition so 
Uh, they might we might be introducing new confessions to people that haven't heard of them before. And the first one I'll ask about is surrounded about the Westminster Confession of Faith 26. So this one is called Of the Communion of Saints, which part of the title today of the communion of saints in the church. So this one, Westminster Confession of Faith 26 of the communion communion of saints. Can you explain the vertical and horizontal relationship when it comes to worship of God and fellowship with all Christians? No, it's a good question. Um, so this, this chapter in the confession of faith, it's brief, it has three paragraphs. And the third paragraph really has to do with abuses, both vertical and horizontal. Mm -hmm. But the first two talk about this very thing that you're bringing up. And by and by vertical, um, I take you to mean that the community of the saints is built upon this, this living fellowship between Christ and his church, or we could mm -hmm. say, you know, God and, and us. Yeah. And and it begins there. And actually, it's interesting that this is where the Heidelberg Catechism 55 actually orders this. I know that. Yeah. You know, about that, I'm sure. Yep. Yeah. But the, it could be more clear. It says, well, first, <laughs> it just it literally uses the word first, and it starts with this commun this union uh, that we have uh, by faith with uh, with God through Christ, our Savior. And um, I, I think that's reflected as well in the confession of faith. There's an ordering in the confession of faith where it talks about the union community we have with Christ um, through his gifts and graces. And then it goes on to talk about the horizontal, the, the, the fellowship we have with each other, or the communion we share with each other in Christ. But it's being very clear that that foundation is uh, is on Christ. And uh, the confession is very Trinitarian, but, but we have to understand here uh, that we would have no communion with God outside of Christ. But it begins there, and I think that's so important, because um, if you think about it, there's there's always some, every decade, there's some new slogan uh, hmm. for mission statements of churches, yep. incarnational ministry, yep. things yep. like that, uh, which is not, I'm not saying that's bad, but the one that's, you know, trendy of late is building community, that a church is about building community. And it's a very interesting idea because communitarianism was a, was a very big push from a more sociological perspective. And and you have to ask yourself, is is building community the same thing as communion of the saints? Hmm. And I've given a few talks on this, and I would say it's not. It's not hmm. the same thing if you understand that building community is something that we can do. If you believe that that's communion of the saints and you have this all wrong, and these confessional documents are simply re reflecting Scripture, that all that you and I share together is what is built upon Christ, is more fundamentally found in Christ. So... You raise the area of worship. So what is a worship service? If you say, well, it's it's our gathering in the name of Christ to offer thanks for what he's done for us, uh, we would say, wrong. It's it's a meeting of God with his people. Mm -hmm. That we believe that as as that God draws near to us, draws near to us by his spirit, we draw near to him by faith. We believe that our worship uh is made acceptable to God through Christ and enters into, into heaven, that, that even as we are accepted in Christ, so is our worship and our prayers, mm. and that our prayer, our, I'm sorry, our worship commingles with that which is taking place um, in the presence of God in heaven. Hebrews 12 tells us this. We're not worshiping in a mountain that can be touched. Um, but in the same way, we believe that, that Christ has poured out his spirit upon his church, and he says that we're two or three gather my name, that that we believe that he gathers with us in a unique way by the Holy Spirit. Well, that's that vertical dimension. And so that all the gifts of the Spirit are, are endowed by the Spirit, and they are empowered by the same Spirit. And, and all that, you know, leans upon this, this foundational idea that what is most fundamental in the communion of the saints is, is God, or specifically the communion we have with God, um, uh, by faith, uh, through faith, by 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 Christ and, and by the Spirit, and and uh, an extended question, I think that just kind of came up to me that I think people will be asking, especially if they're new to this stuff. Even the word, the noun saints, isn't just a uh, 
Roman Catholic, Catholic veneration. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just not it's not just a Roman because ca- people's minds will automatically go to either Roman Catholic or the New Orleans football team. <laughs> so yeah. what is what is a saint? Um, yeah, if you can clarify that. Yeah, no, that's that's great. And it comes from the same word from which we get the word holy. And and so it's interesting that the introduction to First Corinthians, it's used in two ways where Paul talks about those who have been sanctified and those who are called to be sanctified, those who have been set apart as, as saints, but those who are called to, to be saintly. There's there's different ways you could say it. But the idea is 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 clearly this that uh, those who are trusting in Christ are are seen in the sight of God as those who are holy. Those who have been called out from the world, set apart, consecrated, um, and are cleansed of their sin. And as opposed to the idea that a lot of people have that a saint is somebody who's a like a superhero, mm. um, somebody who's who's a, a notch above all everybody mm. else. A super Christian. Uh, mm-hmm. A super Christian. Yeah, these are a cut above. These are the Green Berets of the Christian church. <laughs> yeah. And that that is not the way it's used in scripture, that mm. all of us are are saints. I have a friend that he used to address his 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 church every Sunday, beloved saints. Mm as a way of reminding them that they're holy in the sight of Christ. And it just goes, it's hand in hand with our idea of justification, that I stand before God as one who's acceptable because I stand before him in the righteousness of Christ. But I could also say that I stand before him as holy. Now, we also say we grow in holiness, but there's nothing that uh, inhibits my by coming to the presence of God by faith and, and seeking, you know, his blessing and his help. And he's not turning away from me. He says, you're just too ugly. You know, you just tarnish with all this sin. No, he sees me in Christ. And this is true of every Christian. That's why we say saints. And it, mm-hmm. But it is interesting. You could say this too. It's not just a communion of people. See, community mm-hmm. building is just a gathering of people. It's a communion yeah. of saints which means it's a communion and a fellowship of those who have been called out of the world who confess Christ and understand that the whole only holiness in which they can boast is that of Christ. Mm-hmm. And that it's and that it's his holiness that binds them together as 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 a holy church as a holy people of God. Mm. That, that, that's good clarification. I can actually say that I'm St. Nick and <laughs> Peter you're St. Peter and you're St. Craig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, our fellow brothers and sisters are saints. So thank you for explaining that and clarifying that. So before I before we do go to Heidelberg Heidelberg Catechism question answer fifty five, which you brought up, let's go to fifty four. Um, question fifty four of the Heidelberg does ask, "What do you believe concerning the Holy Catholic Church?" So another term, kind of uh, that is wrapped around saints. So based on its answer, how does Jesus, through His Spirit and Word, capital W word, gather, protect, and preserve for himself a people, his saints, that are part of his universal, holy, invisible church. No, that's that's good. So from, from about the fourth century to the Reformation, the, um, the way that our forefathers would refer to the church or describe it, what were then considered Marx was one holy Catholic apostolic church. Hmm. Uh, the reformers... You know, use those categories. Modern Reformed theologians do. Burkauer approaches the church on, on using those four um, words. But we, the reformers, were discontent with the words. Really, function more as attributes than marks. And it's a Reformation that said we need to put a real test uh, to what is a true church, and and therefore that's where the the marks of the church come from. And some would say there's two marks. Uh, the word and sacraments, and some would say there's a third of um, church discipline. But I think one of the ways to think about it is if I were to ask you, describe for me what is a true point guard in basketball? And you said, well, it's usually the shortest guy in the team, and he dribbles the ball and he passes it around. It's like, well, okay, you just described every point guard on every team that's ever played basketball. I The question was, what is a true point guard? Oh, well, that's a guy who can break, he can break a full court press all by himself. He leads in assists, um, and he's a guy who just distributes the ball really, really well. Say, like, okay, that's different. Because see, and what that says is that you have a real standard in view in terms of what's a true point guard, as opposed to a bare attribute. Hmm. 
And so you talked about the word, and this is the one thing that all the reformers rallied around was the word. And that if you're going to only hunker down on one uh, uh, mark of the church, it's the word of God, and specifically that it's that it's preached faithfully. And so we would say, to get back to how you introduce this, that Christ is building his church by gathering to himself by his word and spirit. And so by the word of God, we mean not just reading it, but it being preached, that this is ordinarily the way in which uh, he wants to build his church. Romans 10 is very clear about this. How will people believe if they do not hear, and how can they hear unless somebody preaches to them? And so we would say this is ordinarily how it happens. Not always. All of us have these crazy stories about people came coming to Christ. I got a ton of them. But most people run into is they, they came to church, they heard a sermon, hmm. um, or they read a sermon or heard a sermon online, something like that. Hmm. Um, but that's how uh, we would say Christ gathers his church. Now, the spirit, we would say, is is essential there. And, you know, Reformed people don't like talking about the word and spirit in separate conversations. We don't see them as two separate streams. Uh, we see them uh, working together. Lutherans even take a stronger stance on this. And Luther said, that, <laughs> yep. you know, okay, you know about that. Yep. But we would say this is ordinarily how it works, that the spirit works by and with the scriptures in the hearts of, of men and women. And so it's a spirit using that word that calls us out and changes our heart. And so that's how normally we would say that Christ sets apart this, this, this church that's Catholic, that's universal, mm -hmm. of all those who confess Christ, but are holy, uh, set apart by him and, and consecrated for his his purposes. Hmm. Yeah, so I wanna I wanna dig in or maybe spotlight one of the terms that Nick used. And it's I think it's relatively um relatively well known within the reform world. And most I think a, a good chunk of reformed Christians would know these. Um, but I think it's 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 relatively big. It's it's visible, invisible. And you've already talked about Catholic, which is not the Roman Catholic Church, it's the the universal church, because Roman Catholic is an oxymoron. You can't have a Roman and a Catholic church at the same time, mm. but you can have a Catholic church. So what what do you like? What do you what do we mean or what do our confessions mean? We talk about visible and invisible. It's like, well, I'm not invisible, so how am I part of this thing invisible? And what what are you talking about visible and how do these two things relate to each other? Sure. Um, I think that, you know, Calvin came very close to using the terms. He 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 really clearly understood this distinction. And uh, I know you guys interviewed Tadataka Mariyama. Uh, mm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. A while ago. Yeah. And he, and he brought this out in his in his book um, that that Calvin really began with the idea that God has always known his church. We call this sometimes a covenant of redemption at the okay. Trinity before the foundations of the world. Um, we could say conspired together. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Of, of who Christ would come and save. Not to murder somebody, but conspired towards a good. Conspired in a great way. Uh, they were totally unified in this idea. Yeah. And in John 17, Christ prays this way those you've given to me, says I've kept them. And I've lost not one of them except for the son of perdition. But he, but there's this assumption of this, and and Calvin seized upon this that this is at the very heart of his understanding of the church that you have these people that God has has set apart for Himself that He has foreknown before the foundation of the world He's predestined them, and He calls these very same ones out of the world to Himself. And Calvin said this is an essential piece uh, to understanding of the church, the elect. He later. Uh, began to develop more the idea of, I don't get make this historical theology, but he's just a good example of this. Yeah. Didn't want to lose sight of the fact that, but it's also something historical. And especially as he was increasingly troubled with Rome, uh, seeing it as a legitimate form of the church uh, with the mass and other things, this became a problem for him. And then how do we, in, as an alternative, offer, well, what should it look like? What is the form of that? And that's where he would insert discipline and say discipline is is key to this. So in one sense, you know, two marks, three marks, who cares? Um, but you have to think about something tangible, something visible. And and John Murray talked about this. Practically speaking, the only thing you and I have to deal with is the church visible, which is all those who confess Christ. The church invisible, one of the reasons we say it that way, is unseen by human eyes. Whenever I dress a congregation, I have no idea 
ultimately who is of the elect and who's not. So that's why you preach the gospel. You preach the gospel because, first of all, it could be that every single person in front of me is of the elect, and that's what they want to hear. They need to hear about Christ. Mm -hmm. But it's possible that maybe none of them are. So mm -hmm. I better preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. Now, we can have some degree of confidence in, in people who have credible you know, faith, and, and we see the fruit of the Spirit in their lives. So, yes, that's true. That's another question. But ultimately, this distinction is very, very helpful. And in fact, I would say, when you add that on top of another set of terms of, of local, universal, or Catholic, mm -hmm. you create four quadrants. And if you're going to have a fully robust biblical ecclesiology or doctrine of the church, you need to have something that can canvas over all four of those quadrants. Mm -hmm. And some expressions of the church cannot do that. I don't think Rome can do it. Mm -hmm. I don't think classic liberal theology can do it. Mm -hmm. Or you might have the parachurch, which just loves one quarter of it, something like that. But I think a reformed ecclesiology takes in all four of those. But visible and visible, I think, is really, really important. And in terms of the visible, that's classically been the target of, of liberal theology. Mm -hmm. They don't want to talk mm -hmm. about something visible. And a lot of evangelical theology has been the same way. Yeah, the totally. The church invisible, when they talk about the kingdom of God, they don't want anything visible. And you'll, and you'll read evangelical theologians, I'm thinking one in particular would say that these are two incredibly distinct things, that the church is not the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is not the church. Mm. And that's not really our tradition. We don't want to mm. identify them, as Rome does. But, wow, we better have some overlap there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a whole yeah. other discussion, but I, I think it's so important. The keys of the kingdom are given to the, to the apostles, um, who are the part of the foundation of the church that Christ builds. And it's Christ who brings these concepts together. And, and like... You know, Kevin DeYoung says, if you don't understand that the most important thing that Christ is doing on this planet right now involves a church, then you're not reading your New Testament properly. Mm. This mm. is this is what Satan wants to take apart. This is where the bullets are flying. That's where the action is. So that's why that visible component that Calvin insisted upon, which at first in Geneva, they didn't like that. And other reformers didn't like that. And even uh, Farrell wasn't a huge fan. Uh, he didn't go with him the whole distance on that. Uh, not Farrell, I'm sorry. His first mentor, whose name I'm forgetting, um, it'll come to me in a second. I thought I'd <laughs> talk about this, but anyway, um, a lot of guys didn't like that. Uh -huh. The Calvin said, "We got to come up with something." I mean, and our poor, you know, church members—they want to know what's a legitimate church. Yeah, and and, the, and getting back to what we where we started with all this, it's got to come back to the word. It's got to come back to: Is this a responsible? preaching of the word not perfect preaching of the word that doesn't exist no <laughs> but but faithful is this faithful yeah yeah i think the question you just asked is the one that most christians have and especially those who are new to the faith or moving or or whatever it may be who are looking for a church and um maybe they go to a church and like oh does this have a good kids program is the music good is um, do I feel kind of encouraged after the sermon? Do they have midweek stuff? Which not saying those are unimportant questions, but they tend to dominate the conversation. And you go to a, a well, just kind of a non-denominational, non-denominational, maybe I don't mean this disparagingly, but like vanilla church, where there's it's kind of traditionalist. It's there's rudderless. There's there's no great understanding of the history of the church, where we've come from, where we're going, what we like, what we do here. Um, and it can leave people, like you said, confused. Like, what, like, what, what am I doing here? What, what, what does the church exist for? What do I exist in the church to do as well? Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> Real quick before I get to uh, Heidelberg fifty-five. Speaking of the visible church, honest question here too is: um, is baptism? Do we see as Christians? Do we see baptism as an entrance into the visible church? That's classically how we've understood it. Um, the way the the Westminster standards are explicit on that. It's baptism that admits somebody to the visible church, and we're not mm -hmm. saying if they're not baptized or not a Christian, right? But they should be treated like a non-Christian. Um, but but it because it does fulfill um, functionally what circumcision was in the old, mm -hmm. which is a mark of being a part of this of this covenant community, um, which was was huge in the old testament um oh, yeah i mean just i mean moses almost died because 
he failed in this, and thankfully his wife Sephora stepped yep. into yep. reach in Exodus yep. four, not Exodus four, but but saved him. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, he, I mean, that's what God said to Abraham: you have to keep this covenant. Well, you know, Paul brings those together in Colossians two and talks about the circumcision of Christ and what he means that we've been circumcised by Christ in our baptism, and um, and baptism is what marks us. And so this is an important distinction uh, that we're part of the church. And there's only, you know, I think we had to think about Noah. In that ark, you know what a smelly mess that must have been. But <laughs> it's the only thing afloat. I mean, that's 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 what there was. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the church has some odd expressions around the world, but um, this is what we got going, and, and we need to to be on board with that, and you need to identify with it, and not be afraid to do that. And it's baptism that that admits you. It's that initiatory right that says. Yes, I'm marked by the king. I'm part of his kingdom. Mm -hmm. And I'm also marked as an enemy of, of our great adversary, the devil. Uh, he wants to destroy me, but I have one who, who oversees me. And so it's, it's, it's very important to understand that baptism is a, is a big deal. And we can disagree, uh, you know, Reformed Baptists and Presbyterians about whether we baptize our children, but we understand of the theological significance of this. This is not an option. Mm -hmm. Christians get baptized mm -hmm. exactly yeah that's why i wanted to preface those christians we believe this not just presbyterians not just reformed so we'll jump into the heiberg catechism question answer 55 asks what do you understand by the commission of saints answer believers are members of christ the lord and have communion with him and share in all his treasures and gifts. Each person is to use those gifts readily and joyfully for the service and enrichment of other members. So my personal question is what if you don't know what your gifts are or how do you know what your gifts are? I'm sure you get that a lot. And <laughs> I know that. Yeah. And I would never say this to church member, I would, but, but Barney wants to say, don't worry about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Basketball coaches always say, let the game come to you. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea what that means. That makes no sense. <laughs> yeah. you know? just they say it because they think it works. <laughs> yeah, just sit at the other end of the of the of the court, you know, because the game will come back to me, I guess. But <laughs> but I think yeah. I think we get this all wrong. I think a lot of Christians take those, you know, gift inventories and yeah. things like that. I'm not saying that's a wrong. That's, that's not a sin. The way I think about gifts is like this: that a gift is often a lens. As a sign of your gift is what you see and what you see and others don't see, because what you're seeing is a need. And Dr. Gaffin talks about this in his book, Perspectives on Pentecost. He talks about gifts and how do I discover my gift? And he says, don't worry about that. And, you know, write down all the gifts that you could read about in the New Testament and start checking the ones that you think you'd like, you know, <laughs> or the ones that your friends yeah. think you have. Just go meet a need that you see something in your church go address it in the appropriate way, of course. Um, but chances are the fact, the fact that you're seeing it and the, and the fact too, that maybe you're the only one seeing this is probably an indication of the need that of the gift that you have. Hmm. But I would, I would never want to say gift. I'd want to say gifts. Gifts, I think come in clusters. I think almost all of us have more than one gift set or something that we're really strong in, but that doesn't mean there's not other things we can't do um, and maybe even do well. So I would tell people that. I would say, listen carefully to what your your honest friends tell you about what they see you doing well and say, you really are a tremendous, tremendous uh, junior high Sunday school teacher, which has only been said to four Christians in the history of the American <laughs> church. <laughs> it's, it's so hard. That is it's the hardest hard. job in any church is teaching. Little it kids. is a hard job. You know, those are the people that you, when you got a teacher doing that, you treat them well. <laughs> yeah. That's right. They your respect. You don't want them going anywhere. No, that, those suckers are staying here. We're going to do whatever we possibly, free donuts before every class. But you but you would see somebody and they're clearly in their sweet spot. You know, they need to be encouraged. And that's really after, in terms of what we're encouraged to do in terms of one another commands in scripture, right after love comes encouragement. And people are not sure of themselves. They need that encouragement of, I think you should try doing this. I think you should join this ministry. You should be part of this, you know, whatever it is in our church. And I think pastors always, always, in terms of gatherings, even informal ones, they're always on alert watching for this. Like, what group goes to join this guy or this girl? Like, who's leading that? 
And, and who is the person who stops for a second and cares for somebody who just got hurt? Uh, those are, they're telling you something. They're broadcasting to you a gift set. And so I think that um, a large part of it is don't worry about it. Just tell me about the needs that you see in our church. What do you think needs to be done? Hmm. And a lot of times what they're telling you is that they have a, just a real strong vision of something that reflects their giftedness. Hmm. That's helpful. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to ask a two-part question, slightly changing the one, just based off of where we're at in the conversation, what I think people might be thinking based off what Nick just asked, because I think it's a pretty big point. Um, so first, first question before I ask, um, and this is partially kind of my, the light bulb clicks. I, I just finished um, for the second time, but I hadn't read it for years, Dr. Horton's Christless Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, and towards the end, he talks about kind of like every member ministry, which I remember growing up as part of this, where um, everyone plugs in, everyone serves, and, and he talks about, I mean, it's, it's fantastic, but there tends to be, I don't know, somewhat of a kind of an ethos that maybe if you, people just walked into your average everyday church, non-reformed, non-confessional church, where it's almost the expectation on the front end. It's a, hey, if you're a member, you like you serve in some certain way. That's It's less, poor way of putting this, it's, it's less, I'm being fed and how can I feed the church? Maybe if you can talk to those who are, mm. who are used to the church is like, this is something I serve versus I'm, I'm being fed at this church. Does that, does that question make sense? I think so, but I'm not sure. So what, what I'm, I want to try to get at is those who go to a church um, and they join and maybe the first question that's asked is, is there all the church is all about, and this is the church that I grew up at. And I think Nick is the same as well. Um, and I'm assuming a lot of our listeners too, where like being a church is coterminous and not a bad way, but with, um, where can I serve and how often can I serve and what can I do to serve mm -hmm. less? So how am I being fed at this church? Mm -hmm. So if you can talk to, to those who are maybe struggling with these questions or a church that's struggling with this. I see. I think, I think I have, you know, well, I, there's somebody that, that talked to me and, um, he and his wife were completely burnt out. Mm -hmm. yeah were, that's that's more or less where i was going yeah. find, find being, rest yeah, they yeah. were being asked to serve every sunday and he was actually an intern and all he did was administrative stuff and serve 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 organize this do that and going to church almost became depressing getting in the car the depression sank in we're going back to work hmm. yeah and and the the person that described this to me they were i thought in a not in a good place and I said, you need to go to a church where you don't do anything. You just sit and absorb mm -hmm. and just heal and grow and are nourished. And, that's, and they ended up coming to our church and doing that. Mm. And, and I think it kind of got the battery almost back to full and, and, and learned a very valuable lesson. This is somebody heading in the ministry, by the way. I'm mm -hmm. trying to keep it opaque enough so nobody can figure it out. Sure. Um, but I've seen this happen before, and and um, I remember some uh, some young ladies came to my church in Wheaton, and they had just they were on the worship team. Worship team sometimes can be pretty intense. Oh yeah, the worship yeah. team leader was just a cruel master. I mean, he would have made a great Egyptian pharaoh. And um, <laughs> yeah, they came, they came to us, and I remember just how bad shape they were. And after only two Sundays, they said they they just kind of went. Oh, like that. Mm -hmm. They just come in and breathe. And and eventually we slowly kind of let them do some things in terms of music um, because they were so talented. And you could see why they had been, you know, uh, used before. But I said, you need to be really open with, with me about this because I want you to enjoy your time here, that this becomes a form of love, a loving expression for you. And that you enjoy. And we, I think we found the right balance in that. I actually ended up doing a couple of weddings with them. They were uh, tremendously gifted. Hmm. It was always, always such a strong and warm reunion. Um, they actually did one of my children's weddings. It was hmm. really, really oh, beautiful. Nice. It kind of happened by happenstance, as it were. It was an incredible providence. Yeah. So, so I think it happens to a lot of Christians that to understand that you have to come and you have to be fed. And mm -hmm. you have to be strengthened because we're sending you back out in the battle. And you need to be strong, strong in the Lord. 
and you need realignment. You got to get retuned and you need to drink in. You need to be able to say, my cup is full and we want you to serve. But I think that's a question you should never ask in a membership interview. I think it's a question that's got to wait. And I think you say, we're looking forward to see how you'll serve in, our, in this church. But we want, let let, let, it, let it come to you. you know? <laughs> let the game so, come to you. Let the game come to you. But <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll figure that out because this is a really organic thing. And maybe you were hot stuff in your church before. I mean, I've I've been in those interviews. Guy said, "No, I was an elder in my previous church." It's like, oh no, here we yeah. go. It's like, well, you know, we'll talk about this in five years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Was, and I actually said that once. He says, "Well, we'll we'll have that conversation about five years," hmm. and you can see them deflate. It's like I'm dead serious because hmm. we don't know you. Yeah. Hmm. So. Yeah, no, that's and the reason why I asked that, and I'll, that's prefacing this next question is I, I know. I mean, at least for me, and I know this is Nick's story too, and I'm I'm assuming that's a lot of people's story. That's when they usually hear the church and the church serving, my guess is they think of them first, of them serving the church, less so the church serving and nourishing them. So it's it's a it's a question I think a lot of people would have of the church that just expects me to do everything and, and me to do all this stuff for free. And um, yeah, when do I get fed? And I mean, I I I've been to churches before where I served multiple weeks in a row of never hearing, like never being part of the service, never going to the service, serving mm -hmm. kids ministry, whatever it is. And I, my guess is that's a lot of our audience. It's wow. that's what they think of church is when they hear service, they hear um, volunteer service, less so um, they're being fed by the yeah. service itself. So yeah. one yeah. thing I do in the month of July, I visit all of our children's science school classes. Cause I, I'm head of Christian ed in our, in our mega church of a hundred and <laughs> whatever. Yeah. I'm the uh, Sunday school superintendent. And so, and I always ask the question, what do you think about how you're doing in terms of teaching? Do you want to teach this next year? And uh -huh. one of the teachers looked at me like, and said, thank you so much for asking that question. And uh -huh. well, of course you're going to ask that. And I think that's probably pretty normal and standard. I hope it is, but you just don't want to take that stuff for granted and tell people that we th we're having a teacher appreciation dinner. It's a way of saying, thank you. And by the way, we're, this is not a bribe. We're actually thanking you. you <laughs> yeah. next year. It's not a, Hey, let's, let's talk about next year too. Is this, this is like your prepayment. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's fun. It's a great event. I just, I always love it. And uh, we, we wind them and dine them, my wife and I, and it's, it's serves some great food. We experiment with it with the, uh, with what we're going to do in terms of the the menu, yeah. where we pick up the gift, you know, it's it's that's really good. fun. That's, so that's good. It gets back to that needing encouragement, right? That yeah. everybody needs to be encouraged, and sometimes that just it's encouraging them to ask, "Are you doing okay? Do you need a break? Do you need a sabbatical? Mm -hmm. just, you know, are we pushing too hard? Are you you feel like you're you know doing this with the right motives? You know, I mean, that's something to check out too. Yeah. So my my next question before Nick's. This is attached to it. Um, it. It's more pitched to those who've been hurt by the church. And so I want to see how how you would encourage or, or talk to somebody who's like, hey, this is all great. This is all, all fine and dandy, kind of high in the cloud language. The church is fantastic. It's got communion of saints. It's supposed to be holy. But that's sure not been my experience at the church. My my church, my pastor was abusive. Um, this church has, has gone down the twos. Maybe my pastor was in the news. Or they're not part of the church, and like that's all I ever hear from the church, is it's it's abusive. It it's uh, all they talk about is money, and so when they hear these things, they're like, well, that's that's not how I see the church. That's not how I've, I've experienced the church. So maybe, um, for those who are like, yeah, I just I don't I don't see it. How how is this place a holy place, a place marked by Christ, when this is all I see? Yeah, and I think we we begin by saying that those complaints are often true. And they have to be taken very seriously, especially if you know you you trotted out there the word abuse, and that's yeah. that's a very real problem. Um, I do I think it's an exceptional problem. I don't think it's the norm. I don't think it's no. standard. No, um, perhaps it's more common than we realize. Um, our denomination is studying that question. The PCA just studied it and produced it. What I understand is a very good report. Yeah, um, and so I think pastors have to take that seriously. Um, I do think sometimes, let me, we'll come back to that, but I do think yeah. sometimes people have an idealistic view of the church hmm. and they come in with standards that are higher than those that Christ has, has set. <laughs> yeah. They have these special programs or, or these ideals. And if that's not met, they say that the church is, this is not a faithful church. 
and this is not the church. And and Bonhoeffer talks about that hmm. and said an idealist will totally destroy your your community uh, because they're they're setting up these legalistic standards and etc. But but getting back to this question, I mean, this is true, and I think what it means is that there are many local expressions that need to be reformed. And, and I think it means starting with affirming and validating that hurt that people mm-hmm. have. I mean, I've been in that position. My wife and I had to leave a small church plant that we poured our hearts into for four years as a seminary couple. And um, we got treated very badly, as did the eight people before us who left the church, who are friends. Mm-hmm. It was a heartbreaking situation. It was very valuable. And I told Carol, we just we got to find a church. And I said, well, I don't care if the preaching is average. Hmm. We need to be healed. We need people that will love us. Hmm. We found that church and the preaching was average. <laughs> <laughs> but those people loved us. And it was a, such a valuable lesson for me as a prospective pastor. But I would I would talk to those people and try to encourage them and say, now, look, every Christian understands this. Uh, personally, how would I describe my own personal walk with Christ? Absolute bliss, every day filled with, with <laughs> sinlessness and assurance I don't disappoint anybody around me. Mm-hmm. My wife thanks God for hours every day for her husband. <laughs> How did I get to marry such a you know a faultless man? Yeah, but nobody can say that. And so, how do I guard myself from being cynical by understanding that I'm gathering with other sinners, and I'm going to be greatly disappointed? But just to make sure that my standards are those that Scripture sets. But but to the people that have been that have a legitimate righteous cause that they've been hurt. Um, they need to be counseled. They need to be encouraged that they need to find that healing that comes from forgiveness and restoration. And sometimes it means finding that person that did the harm and getting them to confess. And scripture tells us that does bring tremendous healing and resolution. Yeah. Um, you've never, you've never been messed over until you've been messed by the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's so hurtful because these people were close to you, you trusted them. It's like being betrayed by family. So this mm-hmm. is a real thing. I just don't want to understate that. Yeah. But 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 scripture has a hard fence on this side that says bitterness is not our option, period. And there might be people who never confess their sin to me that maybe I don't pronounce forgiveness to, but I am not allowed to become bitter. And, and that's where I would be careful with those people. Like you don't mm-hmm. want to get close to that ditch of the road. It's 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 filled with ugliness and it will it will corrupt you and ruin you. And I understand why it's tempting to feel that way. Yeah, I have a yeah. friend, one of my dearest friends, she was away from the church for eight years. She was really hurt, a struggle with depression. But this is far and away the most empathetic person I know. Hmm. And God has used her to bring back people that were marginal and people that said, I can't take this anymore. I can't be part of this church. And she's the one person I know that could put her arm around them and say, I understand. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's really helpful. And the reason why I asked that is not to disparage the, the not, nor, nor to disparage the church whatsoever. But I, I just know people um, who've left the church or people who are considering leaving the church or whatever it is, that tends to be their thing. Like, this is, uh, is this God's best plan for, for what the church is? Um, but that's really helpful counsel for, for those who are either thinking it. And I, I think, too, for for those who knows the, those who are thinking this, too, for for how to come around them and and um, and hear them and listen to them. And eventually bring them back to the fold. Yeah, and it's hard. It's really hard. But there's sometimes, for some of us, we find it challenging to go to church or maybe not completely tickled with our pastor's preaching yeah. and all that. But we could just start rolling down the list of our brothers and sisters in North Korea, mm-hmm. on Somalia, the Sudan, parts of India right now, mm-hmm. world places in Indonesia, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. We can just go right down Eritrea, where it's horrible what's happening. They would they would cut off their left and right arm if they could gather with us to, to experience and to taste what we experience and taste. Mm-hmm. So we, we got to get perspective sometimes and some of what mm-hmm. are called abuse, but they're really imagined slights. Mm-hmm. I could quote the movie Thor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I i fully appreciate that quote that's the that's my favorite movie but yeah that's thank you so much for for that wise counsel for those and i'm assuming again people who are listening are probably thinking this that's that's really helpful 
gosh. And the, the first thing, the first answer you had to Peter's first question regarding serving the church, my goodness, that, that resonate in that story of that person that you met that just needed to rest, man, that resonates with me and my wife so much. Um, not that the previous church we went to uh, didn't have great intentions, but I think we came from a denomination that was very, hey, how are you serving? Serve, 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 serve. Oh, you want to be a member? The second you're a member, serve, and then we won't pay attention to you anymore. And it's kind of like, you know, you're. and then when going to the OPC church, we were we just had our first kid. We needed rest. I remember telling John, our pastor, was like, it's great visiting here. I mean, we are so tired and mm. burnt out. I want to sit down and listen to the gospel. I want to just rest. And we had a little baby kid and we had a lot going on. And who <laughs> doesn't and let like, you rest? <laughs> yeah, he's like, absolutely. That's yeah. So you have, a, right you have a kid who doesn't want to let you rest and a church who doesn't let you rest. I just want to sit down and listen to the sermon, and hear the, the gospel. And also another thing too to spotlight on the reformed church is beautifully ordinary where it's easy to rest and listen to the sermon because a lot of other churches and not non-denominational setting conventional churches uh have a lot of extra stuff going on that's adding to their plate of you has to serve to do these <clears throat> production huge... team media yeah. team coffee team all this stuff this yeah. has to be a mega... church like dr chocolate said, it's just too small to have this stuff. yeah or, or <laughs> so you, it's just not going... much to do if if you're if you're prepping for where are we prepping for a concert here like no wonder yeah. people are stressed out serving <laughs> You know, the reformed church is like, oh, there's a couple things. You're going to bring snacks. You know what? I mean, there's a couple things to do, but yeah, most people are just resting and yeah. serving in other ways too. But it's this based on the season of your life too. In that season, we need rest. And then when we felt like we could do other things, then we can do that. But it's never pressured. I don't know. That was our experience. I thought that I just want to respond with that. That was good. Yeah. Well, Calvin says the heart of that command is rest. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so it's a good god who tells his people you know just could you just sit down <laughs> and just rest so i can do my work in you yeah that's one of the ways calvin puts it and i just love that yeah, yeah. my assumption there's there's their people listening right now who might be listening to this on the way to church or saturday or whatever who are thinking like gosh dang it i have to go serve today <laughs> it's like I, I just want to sit down i just don't want to do anything and they i think they feel bad for not doing anything right like i'm yeah. not serving and that's it's i think it's been so ingrained in us like nick said like to be a church member was to serve yeah not so much to hear the word preached to you and to rest in what god has done for you yeah well that was one of the books i read predicting that the the emergent church was not going to make it because it was so it was so many imperatives yeah it was just it was just law 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 if you want to put it that way yep the people were just going to get completely burnt out and anyway it doesn't exist anymore really if you think about <laughs> it. yeah because they did they did burn out yeah i just need the gospel i just want to go to an ordinary <laughs> church and hear the yeah. gospel yeah so uh last question this one's based on the belgic confession article 28 the obligations of church members so it says all who withdraw from the church or do not join it act contrary to God's ordinance. So my question is, does this mean you're not saved if you're not part of a church? No, we would, I don't think we want to say that. Um, so I had a, a couple coming to my church and their son would come on occasion. He was an adult, you know, he was, mm -hmm. this is after college, but he had not professed his faith. And uh, we would say that, to partake of Lord's Supper, you should be baptized. You should have confessed your faith and should be a member of good standing of a church. And it's kind of standard stuff historically. And they were offended huh. by that. He was offended by it. And I've, that's happened to me several times. People say, I'm totally offended. I'm a member of the church invisible. I should be able to partake. I'm a born again Christian. I have a friend in the ministry. A couple came to him and he saw them ahead of time. They're visitors and said, you know, just to let you know that we have communion and where do you go to church? And they said, we're members of the church invisible. And he said, well, <laughs> you can enjoy the invisible sacraments then. <laughs> you shouldn't, you shouldn't say that. You know, that's not the way you treat a visitor. <laughs> that's but. a great response. I'm well, never going to use is. it, but I'm, I'm going to think it. 
it's a great story, but you shouldn't don't do that. You know, you're, no. you're, you're supposed to have discretion. But anyway, yeah, yeah. but I, I told this couple, I said, why are you so upset? And, and they said, because you're saying he's not a Christian. And I said, did I ever say that? Hmm. I said, we're not saying he's not a Christian. And and by not having, you know, really young children, not your professor of faith, we're not saying they're not Christian. We're saying they're non-communicants. That's why we like that word, that mm-hmm. they're not participating in community. We're not saying not Christian. Nobody's saying that a, a very young child doesn't have true saving faith. We would never want to say that. But they need to profess that faith so that we understand they know what to do when they get those elements in their hands. And so I think that, you know, I was trying to assure my friends that we're not saying it's not a Christian, but we're saying this. If you claim to be a Christian, then why don't you love what Christ loves? Tell me what Christ loves more than his church. There's only one answer, the Father hmm. and the Spirit, you could say. What does he love next? He loves his church. He's willing to associate with it. He's willing to die for it. He's willing to gather with us, all of us schmucks. <laughs> why can't you? And there's a this is in the in the Augustine's Confessions, mm-hmm. uh, and I can find the citation for you. And I get the names wrong, but uh, Simply Kianus comes up and talks to his friend Victorianus. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the names yeah. Peter and Nick are so much easier, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> one syllable <laughs> words. This is so good. <laughs> but he comes up to him and says, in whispers and zero, says, "I'm going to tell you, become a Christian." I mean, he looks at him. He says, "I don't believe it, and I won't believe it till I see you in church." And and I think there's something to that of hmm. uh, being willing to associate with brothers and sisters in Christ who are sinners just like you. It's not a perfect communion. And if it's not this one, then find another one. But but I would say the disposition of the New, New Testament is that a non-worshiping Christian or a non-public gathering Christian is a complete enigma. The New Testament doesn't even know what to do with that. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have a category mm-hmm. for somebody who's not willing to be part of this this visible expression uh, of, the, of the kingdom of God. It doesn't make any sense. But we would not want to say that person's not a Christian. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, Cyprian put it this way. He said, there's no salvation outside the church. And Calvin repeats it. But when it gets to the confession of faith, Westminster Confession of Faith, it says, ordinarily. And mm-hmm. I think that's right. See, I think that's, mm-hmm. that's discreet. It's an important qualifier. Ordinarily, there's no salvation outside the church. And I think there are exceptional situations. But if you're outside the church, you should not be telling yourself, I'm saved. Hmm. And it also means what leads what what that leads to is how in the world can you serve the church mm-hmm. if you're not affiliated with it? So I I I think that um the Belgian Confession is right. Clearly, the Reformed tradition leans that way, is is very uh explicit that way, and that that you ought to be connected, you should associate. With these people, we always these public vows that we take, like for marriage and other things, mm-hmm. is like I'm aligning myself with this person for the rest of my days. All of you can witness it, and you can hold me to it, mm-hmm. and and I will die before I forsake these vows. Mm-hmm. And I think that we should do what Christ is willing to do for His church. And 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 John tells us especially, if Christ loves His church, is willing to give Himself for it, you should love the church. You should be willing to give yourself for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Hmm. it's not asking too much i don't think no. it's a true invisible family right visibly <laughs> expressed yeah <laughs> there you go yeah no, that's good <laughs> yeah so that's that's a beautiful transition to this last question uh and it's just and maybe it's it's been hot recently and i think especially so since covid and the regulations around covid with online church or, or not gathering around the church <clears throat> um so as we as we end, how does understanding the nature of the church and the community of saints affect our participation in the same? So another way of asking this, maybe on the ground, is why is the physicality of this, the, the physical church, so important to this? And it's not like, oh, well, like I'm part of the church, but I'm part of like this online church, or I'm part of this, I'm still part of this communion, but we're online. I listen to the sermon still. I still have a community of, of believers. I'm still sort of accountable to people. What what's what's so important about the, the physical nature of the church versus I think what what tends to be thought of today? It's like, well, I'm still a member of the church, but it's not physical. Right. Well, we would we would say presence is very important. Um, so we would say 
for instance, Christ promises to be present when this church gathers together. That's important. But we also think that our, our mutual presence is significant. Um, so um, the Bible would have a hard time, you know, quantifying something that was virtual. And obviously that's an, that's, you know, an anachronistic way of putting it. Um, but there's really no such thing as virtual Christianity. And now I, I think during COVID things got really weird. So some guys come out just really swinging saying, this is false worship, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I had some brothers I'd interact with even that were, were going way over the top. And this is idolatry. This is false worship. This is not real worship. And it's like, you know, we were doing what we can. Mm -hmm. And all of us are willing to say, this is not what we want. It's not ideal. <laughs> yeah. But you're right. For people that now got stuck there or are content there, we would say, no, you need to come out of that. But I would say uh, we've or, we've touched on several levels of this, but one of them would be gifts. Every single one another gift uh, or command that we have in the New Testament demands for you to be present. It demands for you to, to know these people. Almost all of them are face to face. And and so not to be present there means that you've absolutely cut yourself off from the church of not just giving gifts, but receiving them. Mm -hmm. You're depriving others to serve you. And so there's some of those gifts, obviously, that are expressed privately. But so much of what we receive and the encouragement, I'm, I'm wondering how many conversations I had in, in church yesterday. I, I preached at another a PCA church in the morning and I preached in our church in the evening. But there were so many exchanges. And some of them were emotional. Some of them were important. But it, but it happened there. It happened in, in person. Uh, another thing, too, I would say is, you know, uh, I remember telling somebody um, about the sermon I preached, says, oh, I'll just listen to it, and and, and uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll get the CD. That's what you used to say. I'll listen to it. <laughs> so, well, it wasn't recorded, and they were shocked. And I said, well, it's not the same anyway. And they said, what do you mean by that? I said, listening to a sermon later on, all, isolated all by itself, is not the same thing as listening to it in context with the prayer that just came before that, the hymn that came just before that, the way that you warmed up to worship at that point, because you confessed your sin, you heard that wonderful word of forgiveness uh, that's, that's true of the gospel, that you were made ready. Mm. And hearing a sermon, hearing the word of God preached in that context mm. is so crucial. It's got all these layers around it. It comes to you delivered, as it were, in just the right way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a crucial part of this, as opposed to just you know, dialing up something online, you know, or just recording something, hearing it later. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not the same thing. It's just absolutely not the same thing. And um, I think that's, you know, that's another a part of this. And so I think the, you know, being content to do things virtually uh, is, is just, it's running up the white flag and saying, I'm just going to give up on so many levels. And it means to, basically absent yourself uh, not just your presence but it's to cut yourself off from so many avenues of of, of helpfulness and you know as we talk about communion of the saints it's not like the preaching of the word is the only thing happening on sunday it's mm -hmm. not like that's the only thing happening these times of fellowship that are wrapped around the worship service that we enjoy with each other there's a lot of important stuff that happens there mm. and it happens because you were there Mm -hmm. and and the you can't take the sacrament partake in the sacrament i was about to virtually. say yeah <laughs> yeah one of the one of the means of grace you, yeah. you don't get it missing at all. that yeah yeah there's there's a lot to miss out on that's that's for sure i think you know raising our children to go to worship you know in the morning the evening it just became part of of their of their rhythm of life and um and not to go back on Sunday night on on occasion um, because we're on the road or something like that. It's just like, huh, you know, I'm missing out. And mm -hmm. and sometimes you're tired, you know, and but you always come away refreshed. I remember always being part of this this uh, nursery home ministry in the afternoons and Sunday afternoons, and always driving there. It's like, oh, I'm so I don't <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to do this, and you know, wanting that Sunday afternoon nap. <laughs> coming home so invigorated by people I talked to and what happened there to hear these people, some of them crying tears because nobody comes and visits them. Nobody talks to them. Their family has forgotten them. But here are these people opening the word of God and singing hymns with them that they have memorized uh, for decades. It's a beautiful thing. That only comes because you're there. You don't send them a link 
you know <laughs> mm-hmm. it's not the same thing mm-hmm. it's just not mm-hmm. yeah that's really helpful yeah thank you dr Troxels, as we end this for for talking about the community of saints the catholicity of the church um, maybe if you can point to, and I, you, we talked pre-recording some of the stuff you've written, but some 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 resources people are really struggling with this is I I think we we've talked about other things that are controversial, I guess, but um, this is one I think people struggle with. It's it's attending church, especially post COVID or whatever. Maybe so maybe something that you've written, articles you've written, or a book or something that people can can go to is okay. I can get a fuller understanding of what this is and, and help myself out. Well, one thing I would suggest. Um, to get back to when we were talking about the vertical, yeah. what's foundational community of the saints would be to read something like John Owen's uh, communion with God. Oh yeah. And, and the banner truth has that in a kind of pared down version, a little bit of updated language. So it's, it's more readable. I mean, he's not the easiest guy to read, <laughs> no. but there are a lot of Owen scholars who would say that is his finest work. Hmm. It's volume two of his works, but you can get it as a separate piece, but he has also written um, a book on the responsibilities of members of a church. And as, I'm not getting the title exactly right. And Banner Truth has published that separate as well. Mm-hmm. Like, what, is, what, is, what are my responsibilities? How do I give? How do I mm-hmm. I receive? Um, in terms of community of the saints, though, it's, there's not a lot written um, on that. I had to think about that a little bit more. I don't, I'm blanking on that uh, for some reason. I wrote a piece years ago called Presbyterian Salsa. <laughs> the old new horizon. It's on communion of the saints. And it yeah, for those about... who are worried, he's not talking about Presbyterian salsa dancing. No. It's the first talk thing about... I thought of. <laughs> talk about yeah. De Gallo. <laughs> yeah, that's right. People are like, those two don't go together, dancing and Presbyterianism. That's those are anathema. <clears throat> yeah, but I, I would say uh, Mark Dever has some material on, you know, what's the mark mm. of a healthy that's right. church. Yep. He talks about church membership, how important that is. Um yeah, this is kind of embarrassing. I know James Bannerman <laughs> talks about Church of Christ, but that's a big, big volume. That is that is quite a big one. Yeah. Well, if you if you think of one, you can you can email us and we'll we'll put into the to the show notes. Um, we'll link we usually link some resources here, um, just some stuff that are mentioned during the episode. But Dr. Troxel, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for talking about this a really important topic. Um, yeah, with. With deconstruction, people are like, I just don't know what to do with the church. I'm going to leave it. Or people who are like, I don't even know what a church is. What am I supposed to expect out of this? It's a it's a question I think people ask before every other question, before any other doctrine is what like what church should I go to, and why should I go to this church? Right. Um, so thank you so much for coming on our show and talking about this. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure.